Hi, this is Dean, KA3YJM of Neemark, introducing our first successfully recorded Zoom of a Neemark Elmer's chat, hosted by Spence, WT8WV. Sit back and enjoy Spence's presentation entitled WT8WV Mini De-Expedition to Edwards Air Force Base in California in the mysterious Mojave Desert. Great stuff on a remote setup using a buddy pole long version antenna. Thanks again, Spence. Can you see that? The uh, yes, I I can see it fine. Okay, um, and like I say, this was kind of my my theory for, for a fight for sanity and survival with the buddy pole. And we were going to the uh, course Edwards Air Force Base <clears throat> is in the middle of the Mojave Desert. And it is takes a uh, an effort to get there. You usually fly into either LAX or Burbank, and then drive into the desert. So that's where we were headed. And it, it, if you remember that show on TV, Lost, that was by the time I went to from coast to coast four times in twelve days. I thought I was part of the uh, the crew of Lost. Uh, by the time it was all over with, I did. Uh, before I went, I knew I was I was planning this for several months in advance. I went ahead and got a uh, an LOTW account with the uh, WT8WV Stroke Six, um, so that I could set up a se separate LOTW account using my uh, knowing that the kids were going to be there at, at uh, Edwards Air Force Base for about three more years. So I may end up doing a couple more trips out there, hopefully uh, with that. Um, we went wheels up and from Pittsburgh and uh, there's the dinosaur while in Lost you had the polar bears. I did have a, a dinosaur at Pittsburgh Airport there. So uh, uh, we left early and I have an arrangement with the uh, with the airlines that as long as they don't require me to fly an aircraft, I'll, I'll drink their, their liquor from time to time on the airplane and take a nap. So uh, we did we did leave uh, there. And I always love uh, flying uh, there because you get to see a lot of really interesting places when you're flying over uh, the US there. Now that lower middle picture, that is not a river. <laughs> <laughs> that is the 405 freeway, and if anybody has ever uh, been to LA, uh, it on my return trip, uh, this was when I fl was flying coast to coast four times in 12 days, on my return trip, so that had been trip three, back to LA, it took me uh, what usually takes an hour it took me two hours to go 20 miles on the 405 because I got in there at rush hour. So that's the only problem I had getting around there. But um, with regard to my operations out there with a, um, you know, with a portable antenna, and it was certainly a compromise antenna, um, I operated approximately 25 hours uh, out of those four days and it was usually in the afternoons uh, and into early evening because once the kids were down for a nap I had a little chance to uh, get on there. Um, I was I operated 15, 17, 20 and 30 meters, had very poor band conditions, uh, pretty much uh, very little in the way of, of sunspots to assist uh, there with the buddy pole. I took the 73 ICOM 7300 and the uh, LDG auto tuner. Uh, and as I said, uh, TSA is pretty cool with radio equipment, but buckwheat flour, they're not, they don't have too much humor about. Now, I, I pretty much, since this was going to be my first foray um, with the buddy pole, and because I knew I wasn't going to be able to be doing a lot of sideband. Um, or for that matter, CW with two little grandkids running around there and my son-in-law, you know, his wheels up at oh dark 30 in the morning there as a, as a test pilot. I chose, I thought, well, I'm just going to run some FT8 at 35 watts and use that as kind of my baseline. And the Buddy Pole, uh, I have the Buddy Pole Deluxe and that allows you, the, the, the regular Buddy Pole I think goes to nine feet the deluxe version goes to about 19 feet. Uh, so I, I, it was a little bit over the rooftop of their one story home there on the base. Uh, and, 
Um, oh, and so I had flat desert conditions, uh, epic jet lag, but uh, the temperatures ranged pretty much, I was there in November. So uh, that ranged from about 28 degrees in the morning to 78 degrees in the afternoon. So I was also kind of testing the ruggedness of the buddy pole and it, it is a, it's a beast. It, it didn't have a bit of a problem uh, there with it. I experimented with each of the four bands and then kind of uh, did some post um, evaluation that I'll show you here in a couple minutes. Um, I could switch the antenna bands in about 10 to 15 minutes. It took about, oh, the first time you set it up, it might take 15 to 20 minutes to set it up. I could pretty much set it up and have it in the air on the first band in, in 15 minutes. And that includes guying it. And you'll see that here in a, in a couple slides. Um, then what, when you wanted to change bands, say from uh, 20 meters to 15 meters, you just had to lower down the, uh, the flat top uh, there. And you used these little alligator type clips um, on the loading coils. Uh, and they, t they have a, uh, a little cheat sheet for you that tells you where you want to hook them up that and then you just raised it back up in the air. Now I did have numerous and routine ILP distractions and ILP stands for indigenous little people of the Mojave. In other words, those were the grandkids that were getting in my way whenever I was trying to play. But, uh, and I was abducted uh, as well several times uh, during, uh, had to take three days to go back to the other coast. Um, the band conditions, as you can see there, uh, we actually had 11 sunspots um, that, that day or the, during that time I was operating. Uh, but, you know, we've, we've done other contesting with zero uh, sunspots and still been able uh, to do all right. My expectations for the, uh, the buddy pole were somewhat limited. I knew it was going to be a... Um, not only portable, but it was going to be somewhat of a compromise antenna. But I was amazed at uh, my results. Um, of course, the buddy pole, um, and uh, I, I want to say right up front, I don't get paid by buddy pole. I that was just the the I'd looked at it for years at Dayton Hamvention, and when the kids got uh, stationed at Edwards Air Force Base, that was the uh, excuse I finally had to pull the trigger on getting a buddy pole for a portable operation, but it comes with 50 feet of uh, coax cable, the guying kit, rotating arm kit, the portable mast to 19 feet. Um, and you can pretty much configure it, everything from a flat top to a vertical, to an L, to a lazy L, uh, a V, you name it. So you can pretty much uh, do anything. And it comes with the connectors and the, um, um, the, the nylon Cordura uh, carrying case. So this was the unpacking. I had it shipped to the base there to their house. That's the box that it came in in the upper um, in the upper left hand corner for me. Uh, and then there's one of the indigenous little people uh, holding it up. It was about uh, 14 pounds. That's and that's the deluxe version. I think the other version is maybe a pound or two lighter, but not much, uh, just simply because you have a little bit more mast there. When you open it up, everything was, was in there. As you, as you can see, uh, that's the uh, mill spec uh, coax cable that uh, came with it. And, and it comes with um, a BNC on one end that connects to the, um, that will connect to the ballon. And then there was, it has a BNC on the other end, but they also give you a BNC to PL259 adapter. So you can plug it straight into the uh, 7300. Uh, down there on the bottom row, uh, the first one in, or second one in, that's, <clears throat> that's the actual ballon uh, that you clip into uh, the coil. I'll show you here in a second. And then that's the uh, BNC to PL259 adapter. Uh, they're the, the next one uh, over. And then that other package that came with it, that is the guying kit. And that has, uh, I forget how many feet they gave you three of those uh, 
kite string spool type deals uh, already preloaded with the uh, the nylon uh, the nylon cord and it it worked great and it came with three stakes as well for the ground um, here is the the rest of it there that one uh, over here this is the uh, uh, the rotating arm kit it allows you you'll see here in a second it allows you to kind of kind of key it into certain positions there then you have the uh, base of the tripod the uh, third one in on the top row that's the actual mast and you just open those little wing nuts and slide it up and it goes up to 19 feet down here in the lower left corner that's how it looks when you unroll it uh, of course those are the two coils one on each side but they can screw together for packing away then you have the whips and the arms and the uh, what they call the versity the coils are what's in my hand there you can see that they're color coded and they they have a chart that you'll see here in a minute that when you want to switch bands real quick they'll you just re reference this chart and it'll say you know on the uh, the red coil uh, clip it to the green uh, the green marking and on the on the black coil clip it to the black marking um, then the other th thing here where it says buddy pole that is the versity and these are the clips over here on the side to give you an idea <clears throat> uh, the uh, when the tripod is set up um, it it's already going to pick you up about a foot and a half uh, off the ground there to put the mast in the mast simply drops down in there and you screw that uh, that thumb wheel in there and that locks the mast into the tripod and then the third one in there you can see now with the mast on there how it all is all plugged in you screw that the um the versity on the top of that that tripod or off the uh, mast and then you start screwing the arms in on each side of that that versity now if you look in the lower left corner you can see on the top that's the same configuration that's on the sides there. You can see how there's a center thing that you can screw in if you needed to put an arm in there to make a, an L, or if you wanted to use those outside, um, that's where the pins on those uh, articulating um, mounts go that you can kind of key it into any kind of a configuration that you want to. Then you screw the co coil. Of course, I'm doing a horizontal flat top. The, you put one arm out from the versity, then you screw a coil in on each side. And whichever one, when they reference it, whichever, when they reference the red coil, it's the one with the red plug and the black coil is the one with the black plug. The far lower right corner shows you how, and I hope the guy that invented this made a million dollars. It's, it's brilliant. That is the guying system. And those are two triangular real heavy vinyl pieces that kind of key onto each other and plug together. You put them all, to, you, when you first put it on there, it slip, it, it, you kind of, it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You get it in the situation where it goes around the mass and then you like rotate it uh, 90 degrees or something like that and it locks together around there. And then uh, that's your, as it goes up, you put that at the bottom of the first section, first or second section. And then as it goes up, that's your guying system and you just pin it down then when you have it at height. Um, here is, uh, this was when I was explaining to my grandson that if he breaks granddad's buddy pole, would you, I was gonna punt him over the wall. But uh, that is the buddy pole antenna um, actually at the lowest setting there that while you're working at it on the ground and then you would uh, raise it on up in the air in the center top towards the center there that's where the versity is on top and you've got now got the ballon plugged into the versity you got a, a red side and a black side and then the coax going down there the other one is showing you that um, the kit there for the guying kit and how that is is attached and then down in the lower left corner uh, that is it at 19 feet and you can see the guy wires coming down there and an, an indigenous uh, little person mowing the lawn with one of those bubble lawn mowers. Um, so 
that was a, uh, a constant challenge there. What I chose to do before I left, simply because I knew I was going to be out there, um, my daughter had already uh, explained to me in no uncertain terms that she had enough crap in her house with two little kids and that she didn't need any, need any more of mine. So I knew I would be operating from the back porch. And uh, so I also knew that I would have to be making several trips uh, periodically to change bands um, and to take it down. So I ordered off of Amazon some of that Dacron uh, blaze orange rope. And what I did is I just cut uh, three 10 foot sections. Uh, and so once I had it guide, I just kind of wrapped uh, that a 10 foot section around the main guy line going up so that you could see it from the ground that, you know, one of the kids wasn't walking into it or uh, any of the adults were walking into it. And that last picture there kind of shows you how I used it to, to demarcate the, uh, the fact that I had guy wires uh, hanging out there. Um, this is my treacherous uh, setup there on the uh, the back the back porch. Of course, the nice thing is it rarely rains in the desert, so uh, you, the only thing I had to worry about was the temperatures. So I would take my radio equipment. Uh, I would put it out there when I got when when I was getting ready to operate, and then I would take it down at night. I didn't want it to go through that <clears throat> that. Uh, significant you know change in in temperature there but I just operated there and what I had what I did notice is my gosh and even in November in the desert that sun when it is direct coming at you direct it will cook so I had to take a piece of tarp and hang it up there to, to be kind of a sunshade for me uh, to keep uh, because when I before I did that that radio was getting real hot just from the sun hitting it uh, there so I uh, that was the other little munchkin uh, there by the door, and she uh, didn't care what granddaddy was doing there, but she was going to put her toys right in my way whether I wanted it there or not. And uh, so that's how I kind of had the station uh, set up. You can see the pole in the, in the lower right-hand corner. You can see the buddy pole extended up there between the house. It's out in the yard uh, and the uh, tarp there that I had, had out there. Um, this is what it kind of looked like at a little bit closer uh, out there. All the houses have these um, walls around their backyard. I don't know if it's to keep the kids in or to keep the coyotes out, but at any rate, uh, that was the, uh, the, the operating situation I was using the buddy pole in. Um, <clears throat> this is a more of a close up of how you tap the buddy pole for tuning. And like I say, you had that cheat sheet there in the middle um, and you just brought the buddy pole down. And if I was going to work 17 meters, for instance, uh, it, you, do you use the coil on the red side? It says yes. At 17 meters or on, for 17 meters, uh, you want the whip because what, remember you had the arm, you had the coil and then you, the whip extends out from the coil. And there are six sections of those whips on each end. So if you were working 17 meters, you used the red coil and you pulled the whip out to five sections of the six. So you just pulled it back to the fifth section uh, and you tapped at the green 10th, 10th coil winding back. You can see where it's tapped there uh, on the green. Uh, and then you looked at the black side and it says, um, do you use the black coil on 17? Yes. You tap it at 5.3 sections. So you kind of, I, I kind of guesstimated. I, I didn't get too crazy because I knew that the uh, LDG tuner would kind of dress it up uh, there and it worked, worked great. And then you tapped that coil, the black coil on the blue 15th coil back, but they, they had them pre-painted. So all you got to do is look for them and clip them on there. And that was how you basically made your adjustments. So like I say, if I was changing bands, it took me all five minutes. You know, you dropped it down, check the, uh, check the cheat sheet here, made sure you had it clipped at the right spot and got it back in the air and you're, you're back operating again. Um, these are some of the configurations with that rotating arm kit. Uh, there in the middle, you can see that you can 
you can kind of do an upside down T, you can do a, a you know, a, a slant, a, a Y, a flat top, an L, uh, a, a lazy L, whatever you want to do. And then on some of them, uh, if you're, especially if you're doing a vertical uh, configuration, uh, you will use a counterpoise or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a a ground plane type of, of setup there. And that would come off of one side uh, of the versity there that would then form that counterpoise. And that pack on the right side, that, that those actually screwed into the sides of that versity. Uh, and then you that you could see the two pins there that were are extruded out from that uh, piece of aluminum there. You would just key them up into those two opposing holes on that versity and then screw it down and it would stay in that config configuration and it wouldn't move at all. Um, the takeoff angles for the uh, the buddy pole uh, are shown here at 10 and 20 feet. So it's got, it's got some pretty reasonable uh, take, take off angles um, for it being a, what I would consider a fairly short antenna. I mean, 19 feet is the max I could get it up. So, you know, if you're doing six meters or 10 meters or uh, maybe, maybe 15 meters, uh, it fully extended, you're going to, it's going to be okay, but uh, it's still kind of short and, uh, and not very tall off the ground as well, but it's still, it worked very well. So here's some of the, con the first contact I made. Now remember, I'm in Southern California. Um, and one of the first contacts I made was Hawaii. So I'm sitting there thinking, okay, this is a, you know, that's pretty cool, you know, uh, I, that, that actually beat my expectation right there, really, because I'm sitting there thinking, I'll bet you I'm going to have to sit here and really work for it. I, uh, I got on there. The next thing I'm, I, I was working the JAs. That's a pretty good shot, even from, uh, even from the desert um, with a, uh, a small antenna like that. Then I ended up picking up Alaska, the Yukon. Um, and again, every time I, and I, I was picking up a lot of states, um, I w the, the more I worked with it, the more impressed I, uh, I was. And uh, then this was in the middle of the trip where, you know, how they did in the movie Lost, they always ended up in some place else uh, that they didn't plan on being. <clears throat> and uh, this is an actual one of two B-52 bombers. Uh, there at Edwards Air Force Base. It's over on the other side of the uh, Salt Lake there. Uh, uh, they have used it, as you can see, for target practice. And, and actually, the reason it's there, they knew that they were going to retire that particular aircraft. And so on its final mission, the uh, test flight was uh, at one of those arrestor nets you know, how you, a lot of times on an aircraft carrier, they'll put an arrestor net on, on the end of the aircraft carrier to catch an aircraft if it was gonna go off the, uh, the ship. Well, they were testing that and uh, this was where it came to rest. So uh, we got to climb around in that. This was the night before I had to fly back to uh, Williamsburg to uh, William and Mary University to put a dog and pony show on for work. But that's my grandson. We're, we got to uh, crawl up into the, the belly of it and uh, I don't know if any of you all were involved in some of the older radios. I was active in Air Force Mars back in the, uh, in the 80s, but that connector I'm holding there, that's a familiar connector uh, for a lot of the old military Collins types of uh, gear there. Lots of pins um, there, but a lot of the, the stuff was, was still, um, was still on there. And then over there in the upper, right-hand corner, that's my son-in-law and my grandson there. That's the two yokes and that's the uh, center control of the B-52 uh, there. And then that's my daughter and son-in-law and they were crawling up into the cockpit from the, uh, from the uh, bomb bay uh, in there. The it doesn't have much in the way of creature comforts, uh, according to my son-in-law. That's kind of a, uh, a couple other, to give you some sense of perspective, uh, my grandson is standing there in the cockpit looking out one of the side views 
my wife and, and granddaughter are up there in the upper right hand corner. My granddaughter wouldn't come up because she didn't like how it smelled. And she, she told me no, that she was not going to climb up in there. And then over there on the side, just to give you some perspective, that's the tail section of the uh, of a B-52. And they, by the way, they are going to be continuing to fly the B-52 until 2050. Uh, my my uh, my son-in-law uh, is the flight uh, flight commander for the B-52 uh, test wing, the 419th. So uh, he'll be there for another couple couple years testing. This was when I had to fly back. I left at 2:30 in the morning and got to uh, finally got down to Williamsburg about one o'clock the next morning, put the dog and pony show on for four hours uh, and was wheels up at 4 a.m. the next morning to fly back. Uh, by that time, I didn't even even know my name. That's the uh, skyline taking off from uh, Chicago Midway uh, heading towards uh, uh, LAX and that uh, er, that was real early in the morning. That was probably still about six, uh, before six o'clock in the morning. Uh, here's some other, this was kind of cool because like I say, I was looking at uh, operations as a crapshoot. I'd take whatever I could get. Well, here is a guy here in West Virginia. I, I know who he is. He's a contester here, WV8DX. And uh, I've seen him at a couple ham fests over the years, but I just happened to uh, to run across him. And then I started working some uh, South America, um, the LUs and the PYs. And uh, then uh, I, I forget who uh, ZK4 is. I'm not sure where that is, uh, but it did work uh, them. Uh, and then, like I say, I got co-opted by uh, the indigenous little people from time to time and tortured and, and that sort of thing. And and uh, what I did learn is that a three-year-old, when granddad is not putting Legos together, according to his plan, uh, the project is is uh, is forfeited there. He kept saying I was doing it wrong. So you'll have that. Okay, and then um, this guy was right here. And I, I didn't plan this at all. They knew I was going. They didn't know when I would be on. This is a guy in my ham radio club, KE8 uh, KMX, and uh, worked him. And I thought that was that was pretty cool. Uh, so here was what I ended up uh, doing by the time it was all over with. I did 110 contacts. Like I said, I may have gotten 25 hours in total, but it was just a few hours over a course of four days. Um, I worked 15, 17, 20, and 30 meters. Um, you can see how many contacts I made on, on each. I worked 11 different DX entities and 30 states um, and, and provinces. So, you know, I was trying to come up with some sort of some data points just to, in my own mind, I guess, to uh, justify in my mind that I had got the, uh, the buddy pole. And I, I thought that those were uh, pretty good numbers, uh, given the fact that I'd never messed with it before. And then what I did is as soon as I, the night that I was packing up to go home, I went ahead and got on PSK Reporter for each of those bands in the previous 24 hours, just and, and did screen captures of showing where so this is the 15 meters PSK. This is where I was heard in that previous 24 hours uh, around the world um, from that antenna. This was 17 meters. And then here's 20 meters. Uh, so you can see, even though it was a compromise, what I consider a compromise and a port, certainly a portable antenna system, uh, it got out. And uh, I made plenty of, of contacts to, I made Australia, I made, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, oh, I did Australia, I did some, uh, some JAs, and I think I did Guam and Hawaii and some of the, so I, I, I'm not sure if I got Singapore, I'd have to check my log, but at any rate, it, it was getting out uh, there. So all in all, I was fairly impressed. Uh, uh, with the performance, the construction uh, was beyond what I anticipated. It was very, it's very sturdy. 
Um, I mean, you wouldn't want to go beating it around. In fact, I have a buddy here in the club that just a couple of weeks ago decided to uh, leave. He didn't have the deluxe. He had the, the, the nine foot model and he decided not to guy it. And we got some wind It tipped it over and he ended up busting both whips on it. So he had to send away to get two new whips from buddy poles. So, you know, I would, I would guy it uh, there. Uh, whenever I talked to buddy pole, they were extremely, uh, courteous and very helpful there. Uh, they have all sorts of different kinds of, uh, configurations and, and accessories you can, uh, add to it. Uh, I could set it up within 15 minutes or less. Um, very low to takeoff angles, even at 19 feet. Uh, the fifth, they have a 25 foot and a 50 foot coax. The deluxe came with the 50 foot coax and uh, that definitely gives you a little bit more room to uh, operate from, uh, especially if, you know, I, if the 25 foot, you know, by the time you've got 19 of it in the air, you're going to have to be, have a table almost at the bottom of the mast by the time you have it hooked to the rig. So I did kind of like the, uh, the 50 foot version. Uh, my SWR, especially with the LDG tuner, was never an issue. Uh, I work stations anywhere from 700 to 8,400 miles away with 11 sun sunspots. Um, I think in, in some place like West Virginia here, uh, it'd be great for mountain topping for, you know, summits on the air, parks on the air, things like that. Uh, beach side, I've seen uh, Buddy Pole actually has a lot, and there are some other, others that aren't just Buddy Pole, but uh, where they actually take it on D expeditions and uh, they set it up in a vertical configuration at the beach and they use a counterpoise and use the beach uh, or as the, uh, use the ocean as a reflector uh, and uh, work all over the world with it uh, there. And I, I'd like to, I, you know, I checked about adding the 80 meter coil. They have a larger 80 meter coil that you, is an add-on accessory. But by the time I, I did that, and I got the different ballon for it, I was going to have another $250, close to $300 in just adding 80 meters. And the reason I was going to do that, I was going to do it for the Maryland DC uh, QSO party because I didn't want to give up 80 meters at night in a QSO party. Well, when I got to thinking, man, now all of a sudden you're going to have, you know, probably another 250, 300 bucks on top of what you already had in it. You're going to have close to 800 in it. And I'm like, nah, I'm not going to do that. So I got a, uh, another G5 RV and <laughs> I'm going to use that and, and uh, I can shoot that up in the air and do it there. So, uh, like I say, I do not work for buddy pole. I paid full price for my buddy pole, blah, 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 blah. So that is, uh, the, the portable antenna system there. They have several other that, um, that are, um, you know, uh, you know, similar types of, um, uh, of, I'm going to stop sharing now, uh, similar configurations, uh, that are like a buddy pole. I don't, I've, I've, from what they, I looked at them in the, uh, in the, some of the magazines and some of the catalogs, uh, they didn't look quite as sturdy. I don't know that for a fact, but I'm just saying what I observed from looking at them and the prices were uh, signif significantly less, but uh, I am very pleased with uh, how sturdy uh, the buddy pole came and I've, I've, I used it on uh, uh, field day there for, or not field day, it was one of those others that I, my G5 RV uh, wasn't working there. So uh, I'd, I'd be interested to know what some of the other portable applications any of you all have used uh, there, because I, I do think that there, we, we have certainly uh, opportunities to use portables from time to time, certainly with field, field day, but other types of uh, vacations and things like that, that's to me is what I'm looking for the uh, G5 or, or the uh, buddy pole to do for me. Anybody have any smaller antennas, portable ones? Well, I did uh, parks on the air in 2016. Now, what did you use with that? Well, it depends. When I was mobile, I used uh, ham sticks on the roof of the okay. truck. And that worked great. You know, when I was uh, up in, where was it, Acadia? Mm -hmm. National 
Park in Maine. I pulled off onto, uh, you know, just the side of the road there overlooking the ocean and just put the ham stick up on 20 and just had a blast with my 7300, of course. Right. Well, I was going to say, we have a guy in our club that he would do that. We would use that ham stick as our go to station for field day. And, uh, and I, you know, I'll, I'll never forget the first time I saw it. And then we ended up doing it also for the county fair. Uh, we did a booth there and he would put that up on his Jeep and I'll never forget the first time I saw him sitting there thinking this isn't going to work. You know I mean? My lens, it's a stick. Heck we were making contacts and, and that. So how, what was, your, what was your experience as far as were you satisfied with how much you were able to work? Oh yeah, it was, it was fun. I mean, you know, 2016, we still had some sunspots out there and not probably, you know, I, three or four times I did mobile and then, and, then I'd be in um, a couple campgrounds just having fun. And I had a lot of different antennas I brought with me, of course, because you can never have too many antennas. Um, I had the- uh, Bob, K3RLW said, why use the Lodge tuner? What? Wouldn't TH37300 internal tuner work? All right, let me shut that off. Uh -huh. um, so uh, I used, uh, I used to, there's a, there's a place, I bet you, I bet you, Mr. Wizard knows, the Brit, the, there's a British company who does a lot of uh, um, backpacking and stuff. Soda. Soda, I, is that Summit's on the air? I can't remember the company in Britain, but they make what they call a band hopper antenna. And it's, it was essentially um, a halfway dipole, and you just put, if you wanted to work 40 meters, you just need a little longer with the pair of alligator clips. And if you want to do another 20 alligator clips, and that worked great, except if you wanted to switch bands, then you had to go take down the antenna and do the yeah. clips. So that got to be a pain. So what I finally ended up doing, since I love my little Icom, um, they make a, an auto tuner, the AH4. Yeah. Which, seen that. which works perfectly with the, uh, with the Icoms, of course. Sorry, sorry, uh, Tom. Um, <laughs> And that's why then I bought a, a 30 foot um, telescoping fiberglass mast. And I just ran that up 31 feet with, with wire from the AH4 and then ran that into the nearest tree. And then so I, yeah, that was a wire, just a long wire then. Just a long wire. And I put out some radials from the, from the AH4. And that was the best I had because I could work 80 through 10 with that. Is that right? Now, how did that compare, would you say, then with your uh, hamstick? Oh, much better than hamster. Is that right? Okay. But of course, it's hard to pull off the side of the road and right. push up a 30-foot mass and stuff. But so, but yeah, the, the hamsticks work great. Uh, you know, mobile. I mean, of course, the truck makes a great ground plane. Right. And then, then from the campground, using the finally using the AH4 auto tuner, and that was so much fun using that because I could work 80. You know, 80. It. I, I think it was. What I make it 60 feet long or something like that wire and the age four tuned up on 80 with no problem. Mm. You know, well, now when you, when you switched between ham sticks, you know, from 20 to 40, did that, you, I, I mean, did they work I, as, just as well? Yeah. I mean, I, I had sticks for what I have, uh, 40, 20 and, um, maybe 17. I love, do they have a loading coil with them or are they just coiled along the, uh, yeah, the antenna? Coil. Okay. So the, the whip stays the same, but you just screw in the, uh, screw in the appropriate loading coil. I see. So that was now, fun. I'd love very it. long to set up. No, not long at all. 10, you know, five minutes just unscrew the coil and screw the other one in and off I go. Well, now what did you, did you, were they setting on a tripod or did it, were they attached to the vehicle? They were mag mounted to, to the mag mount. Okay. Yeah, it worked great. Yeah, and uh, so you would ju when you wanted to change bands, you just changed the uh, coil out then on it, and then so that would be that would be a good camping, a good oh, yeah. uh, you know portable operation. Now the wire, what would be what would determine whether you used the wire versus the sticks? Just simply how much room you had to operate. Yeah, I mean if I was in a campground with trees and then I was all set to push up my 31 foot mats with the wire on it. And then I had a golf ball with 
with a with an eye in a metal eye in it and i would just heave that into the nearest tree and pull it up there and you know one campground in, in vermont i guess the the owner came driving by in his little golf cart and did one of these. <laughs> yeah. uh, I said, he said, what is that? So I explained to him, he said, no problem. Yeah. So never had any issues in the campgrounds with that. Right. I did that from, you know, Pennsylvania, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. <clears throat> Although in the campground in New Hampshire, there was a ham who happened to be a couple campsites down from us and he had your exact same setup. Is there, did you see any cross modulation with him or were you operating at the same time? We're operating at the same time. Huh. I was going to say, I, did you notice any with camping or anything like that? Any RFI from anything else in the campgrounds? You know, it was pretty quiet for the most part. I mean, compared to home, every, everything is quiet. So yeah. now I didn't have any really big issues. Most of the campgrounds we stayed at, all the electric was already underground. So I think that helped a lot. Um, but no, I don't remember any where I had to turn off the radio. Mm -hmm. it was never that bad. Well, now, if somebody was going to want to do something similar like that, Bernie, and they were going to do a long wire attached to some sort of a tuner, say in a campground like you were in, what kind of wire would they get? Would, would it be stranded? How long would you suggest? Uh, how would you terminate it if it needed terminated? I just, well, I always ran... I ran about 80, 90 watts with the with the 7300 um, on sideband, of course. That's, this is before FT8 became. Right. Um, and I just ran, um, you know, I think it was, I think the wireman sells that 26 gauge wire, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the steel wire with the copper on the outside. And it's, it's like indestructible wire. And I just bought a spool of that. And I didn't care how long it was. I just you know, made it long enough to go into the tree and stuff. So I probably had, you know, a couple lengths of, of, of wire, you know, and I also used, you know, I also have uh, the LDG nine to one Ballon. Okay. And that worked good too. So there's, there's all sorts of options, you know, the LDG Ballon for nine to one doesn't cost that much at all. It's little tiny little thing. And I use that. I mean, I was trying to experiment with what worked and the nine to one bound worked great. You know, the internal tuner and the 7300 would, would, would tune that with no problem. But I also had, I had the same LDG tuner you have, the little right. IT 100. The, the IT 100, yeah. Just in uh, case the internal wouldn't tune it. Well now, the, if you're doing that, what would you say a minimum length would be for a long wire if you were going camping? I think I think there's a there's a lots of formulas out there. I think for what's the best formula. I know it's not. I'm sure Mr. Wizard knows this. It's not supposed to be anywhere near a quarter wave or a half wave length. I think on whatever band. And there's certain there's certain lengths. There's a chart out there someplace. These are the best lengths for if you're using a nine to one bound. This is these are the best lengths that will work. Well, that'd for. be a good chart for us to have hang off the uh, the reflector sometime. I know there was, and see, Mr. Wizard is shaking his head, so. Half wave, um, yeah, there is a chart. There is a, you want to, um, 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 you have to understand also a nine to one um, is basically um, used, uh, used for a random length wire. So you don't want it. So this is the one case where you don't want that wire to be resonant on, the, on any band. Uh, okay, so that's why you use the nine to one then. Right, right. Now is that, I mean, you always see one to one, you know, I've seen one to one voltage, one to one current balance, then you see uh, four to one, and then you see nine to one. So that's the only time a nine to one comes in? Nine to one is, is for if you're using random length. And in my case, it worked great. I mean, I, I got I got the chart out and there's like three or four different lengths you can use. You know, that's actually, I got the chart someplace, I have to look it up, but there's a chart that says, these are the best lengths to use, and these are the ones to avoid. Okay. And I, I just cut it to, and you know, by the time you go up 31 feet, and I just threw the wire out, and I, I still use the nine to one, because that's quick and easy. I mean, a nine to one balance is really quick, and it works. Hmm. Now, and again, you're, then you're using a piece of, 
coax or something to go from the 7300 to the 9 to 1, and then the wire attaches to the 9 to 1 on out, then, right? Correct. And then there's room for a uh, for a counterpoise on the 9 to 1. Okay. Now, do you always use a counterpoise with the 9 to 1? Yeah. And, I, to, and for me, it was just whatever wire I had in, in my in my in my kit of of for camping. Okay. Actually, what you know what I ended up doing? I don't know if I have it here or not. No, I took a. Uh, there's a there's a Coleman makes a clothesline um, wind up. Yeah, I've seen one of those. Well, I took the uh, clothesline out of that and put wire in there. Okay. And then that's why I use my radials for us because my radials were always getting tangled up in the back. So I took that same 26 gauge wire. And just wound up 50 feet, I think, into each little, little one. And I had three of them with an alligator clip on the end. So I would just roll it out and leave it there. And then when I was all done, just reel it back up with the, uh, the clothesline thing. Now, now, were you doing sideband or were you doing CW or, or <laughs> FT modes? Oh, uh, this was before FT8. So okay. I was just doing straight sideband. Okay. Because I don't do that CW stuff. Yeah. Well, uh, Stephen, have you done much in the way of portable? Um, not a lot. Um, I have done it maybe on a, on a handful of occasions. I use the uh, Wolf River coils to to take it uh, the TIA to take it stands to take it along. Um, I've used that uh, several times when I was up at my uh, father-in-law's place up in uh, Thurmond. He's up in the uh, Catawba Mountains, and you know my wife and you know, my son we just go visit him. And of course, you know, I need something to do than 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 to talk to my in-laws, right? So, right. so I so I bring that. So I bring it with me. I I set it up um, on this property on this front porch, and um, and I, I there was no special occasion. I just wanted to play around, and uh, so I mostly done just twenty and forty on it, and I've gotten out on it uh, pretty good. Uh, it com um, it comes with three radios, but I recommend obviously. Uh, I would recommend uh, adding more radials to it. Um, and how do, how are those done? Is it just alligator clipped together on no, something? It's actually there's, there's actually a um, um, it's not an actual. It, it, uh, let me go uh, get it because it's probably easier if I show you than try to explain okay. it. Yeah, because I know that some of those things uh, it requires one radio radio or it'll say as many radials as you can uh, come up with or. Uh, I know that with the buddy pole, uh, on some of them, uh, if you're doing uh, like 40 meters, you have to get an extra arm on the thing to go vertical with the coil and the whip. And then the counterpoise uh, is a wire that extends out X number of feet, but they want you to have it either draped over the, the grass uh, to where it's elevated up, you know, like two feet above two to three feet above the ground. Okay, so what is that now? Oh, so you tap that coil. You yes. know, my wife has one of them things. <laughs> <laughs> this, so, it's a, so it's a standard 3 8 by 24 inch, uh, 3 8 inch by 24 thread. Okay. Uh, so we can now, so you can actually, it, um, it came with the, um, when I bought this, it came with the collar to um, attach this to, and then it has metal, uh, rods to basically form a tripod on the ground. Okay. And then the and then the uh, counterpoise counterpoise. Excuse me. The radials have um have um the what would it, uh, you you can mount it on these things that screw into the legs. I see. And it's kind of a lug then. A lug. Yeah. Thank you. Um, it's uh, been a long day. Um, and basically it's basically the the main thing is this particular thing where where it's there's a collar here that mm -hmm. you that you just slide and would you and then you basically um hook it up to an swr meter or antenna analyzer and try to find out which spots uh will be make will make it resonant on the band you want to operate i see um now now uh you can actually get a second coil a second coil a second collar so that way if if you're doing like a pot uh talks on the air or something like that and you want to operate 20 and 40 you can actually have Instead of moving, instead of moving this back and forth when you want to switch bands, you can actually have a second collar, so that way, if you went up to twenty forty, you have both of them here, so you can just switch back and forth on the radio without having to uh, 
Yeah. Um, Swap the tap on them then. Right. Because you gotta, gotta, gotta slide it. See, I had, I, I had it marked, but I guess I didn't mark it good enough. I had it marked for 20 and 40, because that's what I used it on. It okay, so with, that's Wolf, that's a Wolf River coil? Wolf River coil, yes. Okay. It comes with a, 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 uh, Telescoping uh, whip? It's, um, probably like, uh, this is the standard whip it comes with. I don't remember how tall it is, but probably like six to eight feet. But the um, MFJ's uh, whips actually will fit into it too. So I know um, a, a bunch of guys that have these have, have purchased the, um, the the MFG whip that's about 10 to 12 feet. I don't even know how tall it is. I, I have the 17 foot whip that I use yeah. with my Wolf. I have a Wolf River coil too. Okay, and okay. They, and they like they use that on 80 meters um, yeah. uh, and so forth. So. Um, so yeah, that's basically it. As you can see, I bought a, I bought a, uh, um, like a tripod bag and it fits right. in, it's, 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 very, it's about, eh, about five, six pounds total. Right. Well, now I know that the, the, the buddy pole, you can get them in several, they have the standard and then they have the deluxe. That's going to range anywhere between the standard and the deluxe between probably three to $500, uh, by the time. Of, how do Wolf River coils compare in price point, do you think? I think I paid approximately a hundred. It was in the hundreds. I think it was in the mid 100s. I don't remember exactly. I think it was. Now that's uh, a vertical though, correct? Yes. Okay. That's a little bit different than the buddy pole, whereas the buddy pole's a dipole basically. Right. Now it can be configured in other ways there. Now can, that, but that can't be configured in different ways, right? I, I'm not sure. I didn't really research it uh, enough, but um, uh, the majority of uses that I've seen are uh, are set up as verticals. Mm -hmm. Now, that's that's basically twenty and forty meters in that one that you're showing there, Stephen. You can you can you can actually operate more bands on it. I don't know what the specs are on it, I, but I know you can operate on ten, fifteen, uh, and and so forth. Um, uh, you can actually um, you can also adjust the the whip right. to uh, um, you know instead of just you know not just the coil uh, not just the uh, right not just the coil but you can adjust the whip to uh, uh, make it work with other bands too. From what I understand, you can make it work from ten meters, fifteen, you know, you, you know, all the way to eighty. So right now, Bernie, when you were doing your parks on the air and when you were doing camping and this sort of stuff, like Stevens talking. Um, did you, were you attaching a, were you taking an antenna tuner with you to make adjustments before you put it up or? I always had, well, I, yeah, I always had my little AT, my, my little LDG ICOM tuner, always had that with me. Did okay. just, I mean, you did that I, before you put it up in the air then? Yeah. I mean, I would get it close and then I'd let the tuner go because, you know, the ICOM tuner is, is not very good in the 7300. Now, I think only I think only do three to one, and that's it. Right. Yep, that's right. You know, yes, the majority the, the majority of uh, internal tuners that come with radios will only match up to three uh, up to uh, three to one. Yeah. Yeah, like Bernie said, that's that's um, yeah, that's so that's always been the case. So my, my little my little LDG tuner was perfect because it's smaller than the 7300. The, the cable comes with the plug right into the back. It was just like having. So it was like having a, a big in, internal tuner, and I love, I love that little tuner. Um, oh, I do too. It's it's great. And for those that like really really want to do uh, like soda or something like that, uh, LDG makes one that's actually battery powered. You can put a nine volt battery in it, and, it'll, and um, right. I forget the, what the Z one. I forget what the model number was, but all you need is a battery in it. <laughs> you, don't even, you don't even need a uh, you hook it up to the power supply. But see, the nice part about the little ICOM tuner, or from LDG, it plugs into the back of the ICOM and it gets its power from the, uh, for, from the, from the radio. Right, yeah, <laughs> power from the radio. Now, now, let me ask you guys this that have done that, because I haven't done that much in the way of portable yet, other than what I did out, out there at the kids. I, put, I had the LDG tuner with the 7300, so I just let it do all the work. It, yeah it tuned up anywhere it needed to be with the buddy pole. Now, I also know that in reading the buddy poles, uh, and I'm sure it's the same way with the Wolf River coils, that you could theoretically listen, if your hearing was still good, 
listen as you scrape that right. that uh, thing up and down the coil to where you got that maximum uh, audio hiss coming out of it there and you were in the ballpark. That's one way they would talk about. But now did you guys, when you were adjusting on the ground, you take an SWR reading and then you were, felt you were in the neighborhood, then you put it up in the air. Did you, did you get a sense that the SWR had changed any significant amount from ground level to uh, your uh, if, terminal height? If, if Tom won't, Tom, close your ears, okay? Uh, I cheated. I took my analyzer, my antenna, my antenna analyzer with me. I did too. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, the way, I mean, my personal opinion is I think, um, especially for portable ops, I think an antenna analyzer is a must for the, uh, for the, um, for your, uh, um, your kit, especially, and the thing is when the thing, and we're also got to take into, take into point too, that when you have it on the ground, yes, yes, the SWS will change when, um, when you, uh, if you, you know, from the ground up, uh, how high, how high you, you get it. So, yeah. Um, so what are you saying then that you, for instance, I have that, uh, one of those zoom, the AA 55, I think is what it is. So, yeah, the rig expert. And so what I would do is go ahead and put my buddy pole, what are, where I thought it was going to be in the ballpark at height, say 19 feet, then hook it to the zoom, uh, the rig expert and see what it said there. And then what, bring it down and make some adjustments and put it back up and be done with it. Um, you can, um, pretty, I mean, like, that's probably what I will do also. Because I think, because the thing is, just as long as you have enough, you have enough distance from your, don't forget your your, your body will also make more effective too. So right. I would give it enough distance and make the measurements. Um, Cause I'm trying to remember how I did it when I did, when I just set the, uh, the wolf of the coils. I set the antenna up. I went back to my, to my, um, to the, to where I was operating my station. I looked at the analyzer. I went back and, so I was actually going back and forth. I mean, so yeah, basically that's probably what the, what the, the you know, the right, you know, the, uh, the, the workflow you would probably want to do. Right. In terms you of know, uh, and, adjusting the antenna. And, and truthfully, if I was in a campground, you know, for a night or two nights, and you know, by the time you get set up, the last thing you want to do is fiddle with anything. And then the wife wants to do something. Yeah. I would just do the nine to one balance and just throw it up in the tree with wire and I was on the air. So the ballon was up in the tree too? Well, I mean, the ballon was on the ground, but then I just yeah. threw the, oh, you know, okay. the one foot mast up and then threw the, what, the wire from the end of the mast. And I was on the air, quick and dirty, didn't have to worry about an antenna analyzers and the, the, little, I, the little LDG tuner would tune it all the time. So if I was on a campground for just, just a short day, you know, a couple of days, I wouldn't mess with anything else. That was it. Just, I just, just do the the random length route wire. Yeah, just do the nine to one bound with random length, and and I was on the air, and it worked great. Now, when you say it worked great, some of you guys have had those, uh, and so that would would that be considered an end fed? No. <laughs> no. Random length. There, there's a there's a huge misconception between a random length wire and an end fed. Right. The, the biggest the biggest difference between an end fed half wave and a random wire is the fact that a random wire is not resonant. The end fed right. half wave is. Um, the random length will use the nine to one. An end fed half wave will use a forty nine to one transformer. There was, uh, you, I see it online all the time and bulletin boards where a, a bunch of hams would actually uh, make the assumption that they're, that they're both the same. They would actually call the random, you know, the random uh, length wire, and then fed half wave. But, um, but it, it, it's very quick to point out that the fact that it is the end fed half wave is actually a resonant antenna versus the uh, the random length wire. All right. Well, let's go back to that because that's a good point to be made. Um, now, you've got on an on a random length where a, a nine to one balance. But you're saying on an end fed half wave, we're talking 49 to one, correct? Well, yeah, but it's, it, and it's not actually a balance. It's, it, I mean, the way, I mean, what they call is actually it's a transformer. transformer. Right. It's, it's I, an onion. 
I mean, I mean, I mean, when you look at when you look at the inside of it, it's almost identical. But you go to you, go, you see wire round, you know, round, wound around the a ferrite uh, toroid right, and yeah. and et cetera and so forth. But 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 when you start looking at the windings, you notice the difference between the nine to one, the winding for a nine to one and the forty nine to one transformer. Uh -huh. um, and electro electrically, is there a significant difference to the way they perform? Well. Um, that I don't, I, that I don't have, um, the, now the, 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 uh, the, the data or the knowledge to, to make it, to make the, um, to make it, to make it a, an educated answer on, uh, for uh, anybody will tell you, there is always some loss with, um, um, any, you know, any kind of thing that's in between the, the, the intent and the feed line. Um, I'm going to venture and probably say very, very little. Um, because it would be a diff there's a difference between a ballon and a transformer, correct? Right. Uh, let me see. I'm trying, I'm trying, I just want to make sure I get because I know I'm trying to make, make sure I get this. See, I don't. I want to answer incorrectly because I know I am. Uh, but Tom, were you going to say something? Yeah, I've used them both, uh, and then fed uh, ten through eighty, and the one I have up now is a random wire thirty, forty, and eighty. It is resonant on 40 meters, but I need a tuner on 30 and 40, uh, 30 and 80. Um, but I, 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 it's there, it's configured the same way when I had, uh, um, okay. There's an, a nine to one. When I, when I had, uh, both antennas up, they were both configured the same way. So I don't see any difference. The only difference I've really wanted is that the 30 uh the 30 40 and 80 meter random wire that has a transformer is rated at two kilowatt ikas icas and the uh, 10 through 80 meter n fed was only rated at one kilowatt which meant uh, 80 meters uh, if you run any power on 80 meters you can burn it up mm -hmm. and so far i've been good on 80 meters so yeah, but no difference. In... Let me see. Hang on here. I found something here. Hey guys, it's a company called Ballon Designs, which makes lots of, um, which is really good for making. <coughs> um, they make a lot of different ballons. Can you see that? Yeah. There you go. Okay, that's this is that chart you were referencing before. Yeah, and my wire is 124 feet. Okay, and so that's the end that's, fed was 132 feet. So this is for random length, correct? Mm -hmm. What, which is what Stephen was just talking about for a right. nine one balance, it's 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 not resonant on, on any band. And if you notice on the end fed, you have a loading coil about one meter from the transformer. And that's to get the, um, the uh, that's that's to be able to operate on 10 meters. It gets it closer to uh, being resonant on 10 meters. But the random wire, it's, for, this one was specific for 30, 40, and 80. So there's no loading coil um, on the random wire. Okay. So in this chart, then maybe Bernie or Stephen can uh, help the group there. This is saying that if you are going to run a random wire with a nine to one ballon, you would want to cut those wires. Any of these numbers or? Correct. But the, the, the two in blue are the best. Mm -hmm. and, and I know Steven can help me here. What they're trying to do is to stay away from a half wave, Stephen, or a quarter wave? Half wave. I think it's. I, I, I'm pretty sure it's half wave. Half wave. So these these are close. These are far enough away from a, from being a half wave on on any band. So these are the these are the lengths that it came out to work the best with 53 and 124.5 to be the best. But any one of those lengths will work. Okay. Yeah. Strangely enough, mine is flat on 40 meters. Now I had to put my own wire on this balance, so I may not have measured uh, 124.5, but uh, it's it's really flat in 40. So Bernie, what you're saying with this chart then, um, 
is that if if somebody in the group was going to go camping or was going on a vacation with a camper or going to be in a campground tent doesn't matter that and they wanted to play radio they could take the radio if they had a nine to one um ballon right and they had a random wire here either 53 feet or 124 and a half feet right uh, they could tie it to a golf ball with a screw eye screwed into the golf ball throw it up in the limbs come down to the ballon come to the radio yep. and they're on the air correct right. all right now does that also mean though that they would have to have an equally long uh counterpoise now don't I'm don't need them that that don't need it with a random wire then huh or an infed okay uh, I make sure that you want to make sure though um with an end I, I know I don't know about the random wire but with the end fed halfway you want to make sure there's approximately 17 feet of coax between the between the um the the, uh, the feed point of the antenna to the radio or what uh whatever or or a uh or a uh, one to one bow ba uh a ballon or what you want to or choke uh common mode choke i have 50 feet yeah, you, and I have yeah, to put a common to, mode choke on mine. Yeah, you want a minimum at least 17 feet for, for. So then now you don't need a, you know, now you don't now we're saying you don't need a counterpoise, but, but electrically speaking, that 17 feet is the counterpoise. Mm -hmm. Right. So. Now, when you talk about the the, uh, the common mode choke, I know that I've got I've had a lot of the G5 RVs over the years, uh, and that was one of the things there that you took. I think uh, they suggested anywhere from eight to 10, six inch loops coiled. And then you put some zip ties around them right there where the um, PL259 is to screw into the, uh, um, where the ladder line comes down into the SO239. Uh, that's a common mode choke there. Would you do the same thing, Tom, with your longer one with 50 feet then? My common mode choke consists of a, uh... I guess a uh, 12, 12 or 18 inches of uh, LMR 400 with six snap chokes on it. Okay. And uh, that is attached right at the transformer, which isolates the 50 feet of coax. Right. Now, I've tried them. Um, I don't think there's any, uh, by the way, the NFED uh, is my antennas, and that's uh, Danny makes them. He's Echo 73 Mike, I think. Um, yeah, Danny Horvath. Uh, yeah, re real knowledgeable guy, but there's no real science in it. Um, you can you can uh, uh, put a you can not use a common mode choke, or you can you know and have a a a good cut uh, piece of coax, or you can try the common mode choke at the transformer. You can try the common mode choke. Uh, at your switch box or on your radio um you can put i've tried them all over the place i've tried uh counter poises i've tried having the transformer about one meter above the ground and right now my transformer is about 23 feet above the ground on a uh, plastic pole they just work mm -hmm. um you know they're relatively easy to to use and there's no real rocket science in it um, but and, I, I kept my common mode choke up on the transformer because I'm not lowering that 23 foot pole to take it back right, down. Right. Was well, that burning? This is the, the, the cheapest way to get, if you want to do portable at a campground, the LGG nine to one balance for 30 bucks mm -hmm. and those 200 Watts and you're on the air with, 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 with some wire. Okay. Now, do you have to protect that? Let's say you're in a campground, you have to put a plastic bag around it or anything? Uh, it's waterproof. Is it? Okay. Yeah. So, the uh, go back to that picture if you can. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay. All right. So, your coax is screwing in there at the bottom. At the top, you're what? what you're, are you coming down with ladder line from that? This from the, the wire this one here is is the uh is your antenna element okay and this one here is your is your 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 radio ground plane whatever you want to call it okay but in this case you wouldn't have anything screwed there right well i always had something on it i just had some wire 
from my uh, clothesline reel. Okay. I just hooked something up to that and, and let, let it run. Okay. Now, Stephen, would you have to do that, you think? Well, I would, because uh, that would be, because electrically speaking, that would be your counterpoise. Right. right. So I would, uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, so, but there, there in that one, though, it's showing that it's just coming to one side, correct? Yeah, here you go. Let me share. Are you still seeing my, yeah, you're still seeing Yeah, my? I'm, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so connection is, a ground terminal connection is available for an optional counterpoise or radial system. Okay. So the not, theirs will match between 30 and 135 width without a ground. <coughs> so. Okay. I love mine. Nice and simple. Yeah. So you figure you, your counterpoise in for that would be how many feet? Similar to the same one that's up in the tree? Well, I actually, no, I don't make it nearly as long as what's in the tree. Okay. And and sometimes I think that, uh, and Mr. Wizard can correct me, doesn't the shield of the coax act as a counterpoise, which why sometimes you need to, you need to choke at, at the radio? That is, that is exactly right. Because you, and the thing is you want, you, it's, you don't want your coax to act as your um, as part of your your radiating uh, antenna system because that that's where you have problems with hot mics and right and, and interference and um, all that wonderful uh, all that wonderful stuff that we hate so much. So and so by making the coils, you're creating that RF choke there, mm -hmm. and that is preventing then it's it's what adding impedance. Uh, to that those coils so that uh, it can't chase on down the line, right? right. You don't want um, right. You don't want um, anything like that. And that's that's where the common mode is right there. Uh, yeah, you don't want any any um, any of that to be uh, radiating. And hence the you know I mean <laughs> the funny thing is years ago I always wondered why we always got so much RFI in the house. If I would have you know <laughs> I just say to myself if I would have known back then what that was now you know back then like I know now I you know I wouldn't be getting uh, I wouldn't have my mother or father complain to me every time I'm on the radio when they're on the phone type of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Now I hear that those if you if you make one of them uh, uh, coils like that, if you just roll up some coax, they should be a certain diameter. Yeah. And it should be a certain amount of turns. Now I've never figured that out because yeah, when I have extra coax, I just roll it up. Yeah. Balance. It's called an ugly balance. You should right. know. Balance, right. It's a four inch, you wound, you, you wound, wind like RG13 around a four inch um, PVC pipe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm talking I, about just wrapping coax up. Yeah, you could just, yeah, you could just wrap it like yeah. in a coil. And, so uh, what's the diameter? Uh, now, would a HF diameter be different than a VHF diameter? That will depend on the core. I think that depends on the coax you use and what frequency you want. The lower the frequency, the more coils you need. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, this brings up another question. Okay, Bernie's out there in the campground, and he's thrown the golf ball up in the tree. He's on the air, but he has, as Tom was just saying, uh, extra coax laying around. Is it good form to coil your extra coax so that it's not getting in everybody's way, or do you just kind of throw it out there and just leave it lay i mean in other words if you're are, is t you got a coil a choke at one end are you creating a choke at the other end is that good or bad that's not a bad thing <laughs> okay I, now, I've, I've been reading a lot about the portable stuff and watching a lot of people's youtube videos about it and some of them were talking and make a, uh about a five inch loop mm -hmm. with the extra coil and wrap it around five or six times to make that balance or the choker or whatever mm -hmm. in the coil. Mm -hmm. But I'm still trying to figure all this stuff out. I well, figure right now if I take the antenna off and lick one finger and stick it in there and lick <laughs> another finger and touch it on a piece of metal, it might work. Yeah. Well, I'm going to say that that's basically the, the whole thing that we're doing with the GR, G5RV that they tell you to do eight <clears throat> to ten turns that are six inches in diameter, Tom. Uh, that was what they suggested for the G5 RV. And you kind of put zip ties around them to keep that diameter there. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've always used yeah. and it. And, it and works fine. Through, but. And to follow up what I was uh, saying, but that extra coax you have at the radio end, 
Um, so, uh, and since in the last, in some situations, the RFI could be so bad that you're going to need more than one choke in the feed line. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I, I can tell you right now in my house, I have a choke in the attic for my anti half wave that's about th 30 feet from the feed line. I have the coax run through my attic and I have it another ballon right before it enters the shack. So that, and th I mean, they're not coils, but they're, they're actual, the, uh, the actual, the actual balance with the, uh, the toroids. But they, but basically that scenario is describing what you were saying. Okay. And so then it, it is good form then that if you've got a bunch of clutter, coil it up then. Coil it up, yeah. uh, I do. I'm way. just a neat freak. I don't like yeah. it laying all Well, around. that's the kind of way I, I thought, thought about it too, but I didn't know if you were, if by doing that, if we were adding anything negative. Well, no. I don't have any coils in the shack. I do all my coils outside. If, mm -hmm. if anything, if anything, if, if you have any you know, extra noise or something like that, it may help eliminate the noise by by you know doing that extra coil and you know you know right, um, right after the radio. So. Okay. Yeah, because I do know that, and that I may end up doing that uh, with the G5RVs because I come down from the G5RVs, and by the time I think it's a 75 foot piece of coax by the time I come down come down go through my conduit in the wall and to the the radio I still probably have 20 feet uh, just out there in the bushes so I could theoretically coil that up dress it up a little bit there and I'm not going to create a problem no and actually on our side now I need to mention it I think that's actually what I have outside my window here because Coax coming through my window, it goes up to my hex beam in the back. I have a, I have a ballon that's right on the, you know, that's underneath the uh, the rotor on the on the mast, and then I have the the coax running through under the ground, and and right before it comes in the window in the front here, I actually have it, the coax is actually rolled up before it enters through the window with the, I'm, I'm using like a RG 316 so until I can get a hole punched in without being too loud about it. Um, have the have a whole bunch of things to come to the wall, so so I have to coil there before it comes in the shack, and then right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, anybody have any questions here? I, we're at about an hour, almost an hour and a half there, and I, I think we've had a great conversation there. Anybody have any questions that they want to add to the group? Everyone. Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Since when you were in California, what did you use for power supply? I took my uh, I took my jet stream. Uh, power supply. It's a, uh, I think it's, what is it? The JTS 45. Um, I, what I did is I, I had a, a, a uh, an extra hard, small hard case carry on uh, uh. bag there. And what I did is I took each, I took the 7300 and put some bubble wrap around it, put some bubble wrap around the LDG and some bubble wrap around the, uh, the power supply and fit it down there so they weren't clanking into the ends of the suitcase or each other. And then where I, anywhere I had a void, I stuffed some more bubble wrap or a t-shirt or something like that, just to kind of pad it. And I carried that on. Now uh. I did have to open it up one time. The other time they sent it right through and nobody batted an eye at it. I was surprised. I would think if I was a TSA agent, I saw that crap coming I, through, I would I, go nuts, you know. I'd want to check it out too. Yeah, Thank but you. the one, they did open it up and look at it, and they just closed it up and said, go ahead, you know. Of course, now what I did is I made sure that in anything that had any of my ham radio gear, I had a copy of my license, and I had a little description there that this is – uh, a power supply for my ham radio. This is an antenna tuner. This is the radio, uh, ham radio. Uh, uh, they're okay. just so that if somebody this opened up. This is a pressure cooker. Right. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So that if, <laughs> if then when I opened up my wallet to confirm that it's me and here, by the way, here's my FCC license that corresponds to what's in that bag, you know, but they were, I thought they'd be much more uh, vigilant about it, but I think that they must be able to see that stuff well enough to know that, or they've seen enough of it. Um, there, they said they see those, the, uh, HTs come through all the time. So, uh, they didn't see it too. Uh, I, I'm sure. Cause I used to travel all the time for work as a field support representative. So I'd go through and I'd have to pull up my laptop out and put it in the tray in the bag and go through and I'd have two or three extra 
external hard drives and about 27 different freaking cables in there. Yep. So I can imagine what it looked like on the x-ray machine when it came through. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And like I say, that, that was what amazed me is that all my crap went through, but buddy, they went nuts about buckwheat cake flour. <laughs> it was just, I mean, my gosh. I, I, and why I, did you take buck, buckwheat? Well, we have what we call the Buckwheat Festival up here, just in Preston County here, halfway between here Lobop. and Garrett County. Okay. And it's buckwheat, like pancakes, they pancakes, make them out right. of buckwheat. And uh, it's it's kind of almost like a sourdough type mm -hmm. of, of, of wheat flour. But it's a, it's a unique taste, but my daughter loves it. And of course, she's not around here anymore. She can't go to the Buckwheat Festival. And, you know, we get it here in the stores where they don't get it there in the, uh, mm. in, in California. And so she was kind of wanting to show the kids and she and Chris, my son-in-law are originally from here. And every once in a while, I like to have some Buckwheat cakes on Saturday morning or Sunday morning and, and that, but, but one thing is. Uh, Steve, is that, you got a bear one. sitting in your lap. Yeah. Uh, this is Bob. Okay. That looks like a rabbit dog to me. <laughs> So. A beagle, right? Yeah, he's a beagle. But the, the only thing he does is sniff out food and eat it. Oh, okay. I'm gonna say, I had uh, I had rabbit dogs that hunted them for years and years, and then had only had one in the in the bunch, and he wouldn't chase a hot biscuit. But mm. uh, they, hey, Steph, uh, before yeah. we leave, I like to say that uh, I helped today put up a killer 160 meter L antenna today at uh, W3JX's QTH today. And uh, as we were working on it this morning, we were calling it, this is the beat Tom antenna. <laughs> yeah. Nothing and like putting up an antenna right before a hurricane. Well, you know. Hey, we, that's right. We left slack in it. You made sure to well, slack. what I would like for us to do, you know, this, uh, this, we, we, in the previous fireside chat, I believe we talked about uh, bonding and grounding. And that tonight I wanted to talk about portable types of antennas. Maybe next time uh, we get you and JX to uh, talk about uh, 160 meter antennas because that is a, a subject all in a, of themselves. I've always wanted one. But I, don't, I know that it's going to take a little bit uh, of height and length and I think I have that but I think it's going to take a little bit more than just that. With the well, see, We're in luck because Tom doesn't have the height or the length so we're good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I, I can make a vertical, but I just, I don't have the room to lay out the correct amount of radials. Yeah. So, um, well, let's think about talking about that. The, uh, the next time, uh, that's always an interesting topic and we've got some hands on, uh, guys that have done it there, but, uh, does anybody have any other questions about portable? If, if we hear of any other portable solutions there, we can, revisit those because portable operations is a lot of fun. Um, I'm getting ready. I'm, I'm taking the uh, buddy pole uh, with me as a backup um, next weekend over to Oakland, Maryland, but uh, I'm planning mm -hmm. on stringing up the uh, G5 RV between two trees there. I got to figure out if I'm going to take a tent. I'd like to, if, if I can do it, I'd like to be able to set up in his garage. I just don't know if that's going to, uh, if that's going to, be doable or not um with where i have to run the you know the the uh, ladder line down and, and that i may have to pitch the tent but i have no idea what the uh, weather is going to be next weekend so that'll have a lot to do with that mm -hmm. uh, so then today then tomorrow right <clears throat> yeah definitely i've well, done a, a bunch of research on different portable antennas because that's really what i'm interested in because in the army i was a ford observer so i walked around with a radio on my back so i'm used to having the throw WD-1 antenna wire up in a tree and make a makeshift directional antenna to try and get comms. So, you know, that's right. kind of what I've done. It's what I'm interested in. And they've got a bunch of different portable ones that you can buy the kits. Some of them are four or $500. Some right. of them are $150. Right. And, uh, you know, cause I really want to get into the POTA soda stuff. Right. So hopefully, hopefully in about a year or so, I'll have a little bit more input. I well, know good. I've looked at the, uh, DX Commander is one of them. He makes a soda portable one. His is like $150. And some of the videos I've seen, it says it's real good. There's the Super Antenna MP1 right. and uh, uh, Chameleon Impasse, but both of those are four or $500 for that right. kit. Well, 
Well, you know, and, and the I'm other thing to the point to get a BNC connector with a little banana clips on the back and just get some wire and throw it up in a tree. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that, that that's probably very doable. I know that I was going to, I was telling you, I was putting in a new uh, furnace and air conditioning here in the house the last few weeks. And I had to get up in the attic and get rid of 37 years worth of junk uh, that had no idea why we kept everything. But at any rate, believe it or not, I ran across two um, VHF antennas. One was from, uh, both of them from the Dayton Hamvention somewhere along the line. I can't remember when I got them. That's how old it was there. One of them is a commercial uh, type. The other was a, uh, it was because I was, I got it uh, when I was in Air Force Mars. It was a giveaway that they were cleaning out some uh, extra equipment. And it was actually to mount on a Jeep. And it was for uh, basically uh, the VHF uh, frequencies there. And I have no, I, 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 it's still in the box. But I'm wondering whether, uh, Steve, that uh, there would be any kind of military surplus uh, with some of that radio antenna stuff available. I don't know. I've looked at some of it because the Chameleon Empass has a long whip extended that folds just like the long whips we used in the army. It's basically the exact same thing except the commercial version. It's got a string with a spring in it. You just pull the pieces out and fold it over. Okay. Now so, this one that you used in the army though, I mean, was, was that cobbled together in the field or did that come together as a kit or? That one was what we called our, our long whip antenna. And it just had a base that screwed in the top of the, the radio Okay. where the antenna goes and you just screwed it on there and i mean it did a better job than a little short whip that always got bent over that would never stand up straight right <laughs> how long was that I, whip that long whip um i think it's six or eight feet okay so it, it raised it up some it helped and i'm sure the military testing them out for the frequencies we used and had all that set up i just ordered a the Ed Fong roll-up J-Pole that'll work on VHF and UHF, and that should be here this week. So I'm, I'm hoping to get that, and I figure even for my little HT, if I take that, throw a string up in the tree and kind of pull it up and get it 10, 15 feet up in the air, it should help me get some better reception with my HT. There you go. That should should work, and I'm sure Stephen and some of them can – I know that I've been following that drama from all the way here in the mountain state, Stephen, and it sounds to me like uh, you've been pretty busy getting everything set up. I don't know what the hell happened. Um, it just, it just today I lost the, you know, the, the interlink and just stopped working. Um, when I'm, it's early in the game, I can afford to uh, basically redeploy it. Um, since we, I mean, this is funny because I just got several guys on there right now. I'm taking it down, but, but, uh, for, it's going to take me about a day to redeploy it, but I want, I'm going to redeploy it in a way where there's better, um, in case something happens, like, like a power goes out here, uh, you could, yeah, you know, it can still be used because right now it's, there's, right now there's no, um, there's, there's a little redundancy in terms of, in terms of, uh, um, keeping it on the air. Yeah. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to redeploy it and uh, change the uh, the workflow of, of the uh, reflector, and that way, that way, if something if if I have to if I have to take something down here, everything everything else would be fine. The only the only thing that that, that would depend on coming coming through my network is the uh, is the vocoder chips that are in back of the computer, uh, providing the transcoding for D star uh, to the rest of the uh, reflector. Um, you know that requires a hardware solution. There, there is a software solution. I wish the software solution were, was good for it, but uh, I think. But uh, to save everybody from the technical aspects of it, the the software solution, the software solution to the do the voice transcoding for D Star really sucks. Mm -hmm. um, it, you might as well just uh, you might as well just pick up the phone and throw the radio out because then that's not what we want to do. Right. Hi, uh, Bernie. Uh, you can give me your radio. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks. Well, I appreciate everybody showing up tonight. I think we we shared some good information. I know I learned a few things, and and I hope everybody else did too. I know Steve's getting ready to uh, 
think about Pona and Soda. I hope we helped you at least jog some things in your, your mind, at least to, to look for and consider. And uh, like I say, if we hear yeah. of any other portable solutions here in the interim, we'll revisit this topic. Uh, and Bernie, I'll just say, say that you can let, let JX know that uh, in September, uh, we'd like to have a, a bit of a report on the uh, 160 meter uh, party there a little bit and about what his, uh, how he's, you know, how many contacts he's making and how he's using it. And well, you know, both, uh, both Scott and uh, Gary are also building um, 160 meter L antennas. Is that right? Yeah, they both got the, uh, they both ordered the kit, the DX engineering radial kit. They ordered that kit and they both got their wire in, I guess, yesterday from Home Depot. So we got three against Tom now. So it's going to be. Okay. Man, well, it's nice to have a, it's nice to have trees tall enough to do that with. I mean, geez. <laughs> yeah. How, how tall, is, how, how high up does it have to go? As high as you can. Yeah. I think Scott says he can get his almost 100 feet vertical. Yeah. And I think JX is about about 80 feet vertical, the one we just put up today. Now, if it's coated wire, can it touch the tree? You can, but, you know, they're, they're trying, like, we, we kept it out of the trees that JX is today. How'd you do that? Because he's, because he's JX. Yeah, I mean, did he use a pulley system or something to... Yeah. Yeah, he, he, he first put a wire up as high as, well, well, Ted came out with his bow and arrow and shot an arrow over the top of the tree. Yeah, and I saw then, that picture. Then he, yeah, I put that on Discord. Then he uh, put the pulley on that and pulled the pulley up. So hmm. that way the pulley can be out from the tree limbs and then the wire comes vertically down and goes out that way. Mm -hmm. Really slick. Cool. So well, whole, we'll have to get a report on that then. The whole goal here is to, is for uh, Scott and Gary to get those multipliers on 160 that Tom can't get. <laughs> oh, Tom, tell you what, you you make one mistake in your life and they never let you live it down, don't you? <laughs> you, you feel the love, Tom? Yeah. That's okay. Um, he's on medication. He's, he, yeah. he's medicated. <laughs> if I could only get him medicated whenever, whenever I'm going against him late at night. <laughs> Well, that's what Scott said today on Discord, didn't he? Why don't you take one during the next contest? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I wouldn't be any good. Uh, yeah. But I plan on giving it a full effort this weekend because we're coming to number one this time. Right, that's yeah, right. I'm going to do it full, yeah. Well, I look forward to working every one of you this coming weekend from Garrett County. At least that's what I hope. I'm, I imagine I will have well, to find you guys on 80 somewhere along the line. You right. don't want to work us. Well, I, We're want, no I, points. I want multipliers. No, don't I get multipliers for you guys? Not for working us. Okay. Yeah, but you still, but you still can work all all counties though in Maryland. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you can work the counties. Yeah. So, definitely try and work as many people as we can. Yeah, so I, I know I don't, you can work Harford County, no problem. I'm not sure about that county near Baltimore. Yeah. Uh, oh, that Anne Arundel County. Yeah, those those people there. I'm not no, sure. That county's about. named after some girl. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right well listen folks i appreciate you all being here it's a good evening as always with uh with everybody we'll have fun i tell again. you like, steve's dog's making me itch I know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> don't forget to to hit uh, to stop the recording oh and, yeah better stop uh, we that will, now. we will uh, catch up with everybody later so i'll catch i'll talk to you guys tomorrow on the uh, reflector and on discord then if Steven gets it up, yes. Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'll do my best. Like I said, um, as soon as, uh, let's see, as soon as I uh, hit the show, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start working on it. And uh, like I All said, right. um, when I'm in the office tomorrow, I can. Uh, everybody, I, everybody be safe tomorrow, too, please. Yeah. yeah. All right. You guys take care. We'll see. Have a good night.